Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. My name is Tegan Clary. I'm the VP of Marketing at Unchained Labs. Really happy that you decided to join us today for this um, live demo of the Big Tuna. Um, we're going to uh, go through the instrument and um, the concept of automated buffer exchange. But before we do that, I just want to let you all know you can actually ask us questions throughout the presentation and then also at the end. All you have to do is in the Zoom navigation bar, either at the top or the bottom, you can just click on Q&A and then enter your question there. We'll try to get through as many of them as we possibly can today. Um, and I'm hoping that many of you might have questions for us. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Joe Barco, our Senior Director of Marketing. Hey, Joe, how are you today? Hi, Tegan, good morning. Nice to see you. I see we wore the same shirt today, so that's nice. <laughs> Um, Joe's actually going to take you guys through the Big Tuna. Uh, some of you may not be uh, com uh, completely up to speed on what automated buffer exchange is, uh, our approach to it and how it works. He's going to first take you through that. And then he's actually going to take you through the hardware and show you the Big Tuna that's standing there right behind him um, and walk you through that instrument and how it works. Uh, so again, we're, we're happy to have you today. Joe, I'll let you go ahead and take it away and then we'll get to the questions at the end. Okay. Thanks, Tegan. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning uh, from our headquarters in Pleasanton, California. What I'm going to do today is talk to you about how to replace this, a bunch of these, with this, which is an unfilter, which is going to allow you to do buffer exchange in a higher throughput and more controlled manner, and best of all, without you having to sit in front of it and babysit it. So this is the instrument. It's a fully automated platform. We uh, have designed the software intended to be for a novice, and a novice user to come up and use it. So someone who's more of a protein scientist than an automation engineer, although an automation engineer can still use it as well. As Tegan said, let's first talk about the principles and the benefits of automating it. And then we'll talk more specifically about the hardware. So let me just move over to my computer. We'll do some uh, switcheroos here. And we will start to go through the, the slides. Okay, so Big Tuna is, buffer exchange is a chore, right? So it's not something that anyone, I think, comes in as a scientist and like all pumped and jazzed to do it. And so, but it's a chore that we hope the Big Tuna will help, help you eliminate in your lab so you can focus on um, more interesting and fun things to do. Buffer exchange is a chore that shows up everywhere. So almost every step of protein work, whether it's purification or concentration, or activity assays or conjugation all require some level of either some level of cleanup and defaulting or full on buffer exchange. And so it shows up everywhere in the process of working with proteins and biologics. Despite the fact that it shows up everywhere, we're all still kind of in these old school methods that maybe we did in graduate school. And those methods are tried and true and have lasted a long time because they do provide benefits, but they also provide uh, some level of drawbacks as well. So let's start with dialysis. Dialysis is uh, you uh, very easy to set up. Uh, it's all walk away. Uh, unfortunately, it's a long time to walk away. So it's generally run overnight uh, or even even longer in some in some cases, multiple steps. And the problem is you also you often get out of that with a protein that's more dilute than what you started with. And so in addition to taking a long time, you still have to go back through a centrifugation step or a concentration step. So you could start at the centrifugation steps in the centrifugal filters uh, and they're fairly easy to set up. Uh, eventually, you run out of space, especially if you're managing it with multiple samples or, or lots of different samples. And then the methodology, uh, it kind of fit, uh, starts to fall apart when you're at higher protein concentrations. Uh, and if you're running a long time, because what will happen is the protein will concentrate at the membrane, slow down flow, possibly clog the membrane. Finally, you have TFF. It's a great method, which you get out of the problems of uh, uh, concentrating protein at the membrane. The problem is it's really designed for higher throughput or higher scale, so larger volume amounts. And that's partly also a factor of the setup. So the setup takes a long time to set up and the cartridge ends up being fairly expensive uh, as well. And so what we're gonna do is try to take the best uh, features of all of these, which is the ease of use of dialysis and the straightforward process of centrifugation and the benefits of sort of protein quality for TFF and combine it into one platform that can be used smaller scale uh, lower volumes and in a high throughput manner. And so that's how we came up with Big Tuna. So Big Tuna will allow you to do up to 96 uh, simultaneous buffer exchanges. You can work at low volumes, so you can be as low as 100 microliters of sample. 
to higher volumes as much as eight mils uh, per sample. I should say per well, because you can use multiple uh, wells for a single protein. Setup time is fairly straightforward. So it's less than 30 minutes uh, to get your experiment set up, designed, uh, prepare your deck, and then leave. It works with a wide variety of protein concentrations. So you can be at sub mig, one mg per mil, all the way up to about 200 mg per mil of IgG. And you can use other proteins and, and uh, exchange as well on the platform. One key change we've made is we've made this a plate-based uh, exchange. And so we have designed these unfilters, we call them, which are a 96-well base format or a 24-well uh, format. Uh, the 96-well format can do 100 to 450 microliters of sample per well. The 24 can do 450 microliters to uh, 8 mils per well. The, uh, they come in different molecular weight cutoffs, uh, 3 to 100 for the 96, and then 10 kD is the default for the 24. Both, mem both have RC membranes fused in the bottom. We manufacture these plates ourselves here, and we do 100% pressure testing on every single well on every single plate before they go out the door with the intent that it's not a, a question about how it's going to work when you get there. From a cost standpoint, this breaks out to be much more cost effective than it would be if you were doing this on, say, a centrifugation uh, filtration method. We fully automated what you would have to do. So if you think about how you do, normally do buffer exchange and say by centrifugation filters, you add a volume, you check the volume, you put it in the centrifuge, you wait, you come back, look to see what volume has been removed, and then you add in the new buffer and repeat that process over and over again. So what we're going to automate is we're going to automate the measuring the volume process. Uh, we're going to automate that cycle. Instead of doing centrifugation, we're going to do a, a pressure chamber and that pressure chamber is pressurized to about 60 PSI, and that is going to have a gentle orbital mixing occurring while, while that's happening. Uh, after a certain pressurization time, we'll come back and measure the volume again, refill with a new buffer uh, to the initial target, and repeat that process uh, again until you've reached the exchange level that you want. So oftentimes we'll get asked, why do we mix? And so one thing to think about is how uh, dead end ultrafiltration works. So dead end ultrafiltration will concentrate your protein at the membrane surface. That will eventually slow down your flow, potentially foul your membrane, and potentially uh, impact the quality of your protein if your protein can't be concentrated in that formulation. With orbital mixing, we keep the solution uniform, so very similar to a TSF process. That allows us to have faster flow through the membrane, which allows us to exchange faster and allows us to have better quality of protein at the end. By automating it, you get a lot of control and pr of your process that you don't have if you're doing things manually. First is on the percent removal per cycle, which is if I have a very low protein concentration, I may want to completely drain that well to get to about 75% uh, down or something like that. If I have a high protein concentration, I may want to be more gentle. I may want to do a smaller amount of buffer uh, replacement in every cycle. For percent exchange, if I'm doing something kind of quick and dirty, I might want to just stop at uh, a low percent exchange, which is 96%. Uh, if I'm doing something where I really need to make sure that that old buffer has been removed, I can go longer and do a higher percent exchange cycle to 99 or above. For concentration, I don't have to concentrate to the uh, initial volume. So I can concentrate at a lower volume than my starting point. So up to 16 fold, depending on the plate you're using. Uh, you can also just concentrate. So you, you can just go right to the system and concentrate your wells down without doing any buffer exchange process. This is relatively fast, so I can exchange 96 samples in low concentration at in under an hour. So protein concentration, as that increases, you will increase the viscosity of your solution, which will slow down flow on any method. Uh, if here you can see that even if we're at about 50 mg per mil in a higher volume on filter 24, we can still finish in six hours. And the benefit here is two things. One is that it's six hours that you get fully back to do whatever you want to do. Um, and you can also, it's completely unattended and it's still, and it's higher quality than what you would get in a centrifugation filter. You can also have the option to run overnight and people will oftentimes do that if they weren't running at higher uh, protein concentrations. The software itself has been designed so that someone who's a novice, novice uh, automation person can come up and use it. Someone ideally who, even someone who's never used the system at once should be able to kind of work, walk through and figure it out. So we have it designed where we have these uh, steps like a wizard, and then you uh, enter certain information on in each step. 
uh, you enter on this first screen, the just the experiment name that you want, the application, the plate format that you're using. Uh, it won't let you move on to the next step until all the proper boxes are filled out. It will also give you checks as you go to make sure that you're, you're choosing something that's going to be valid, a, a valid experiment. This intermediate screen is where you get to after you've imported or entered your proteins or, and imported your formulations uh, that you're using. Here's where you kind of click and drag and move your samples into place as to how you want to actually have the exchange performed. And then this is my favorite screen. This is a screen that tells me how much time I have left on my experiment. And this is designed like big buttons, big windows, so that I, if I'm outside the lab, I can kind of peek in or across the room and I can kind of get a sense about where it's at without having to walk up to the machine and use it and, and look at it. So this is all design meant. There's a, a few steps I skipped here, which is to talk about how to, it tells you how, um, how to lay out the deck. It tells you how much volume you need of everything. All of that stuff is kind of contained within uh, this experimental flow. What I think you'll see today is how it can be used and hopefully how you can start a discussion within your laboratory about how you can use it across different applications that you may need that requires buffer exchange. So whether that's protein purification and you just need to concentrate down a lot of material all the way to formulation optimization where you may have very high protein concentrations that you need to get into what would be close to a final formulation. So our goal here is that Big Tuna will help you uh, run uh, sleep easy because rest easy because you know you have uh, uh, buffer exchange taken care of. So with that, let's go back to the instrument and we'll talk about uh, how that these benefits translate into uh, how the hardware is set up. Okay, now that I'm back in front of the instrument, you kind of get a sense of the scale. So it's about 1.8 meters high. It's about a meter long, three quarters of a meter deep. This is about, um, it's on casters, and so it's about the size of a laboratory bench. Uh, you can move it around a little bit. You need power and you need pneumatic connections. Uh, the chamber door just opened, so let's look at it from above and talk about it uh, from that approach. So what you can see first is the buffer exchange chamber door. So your buffer plate, your, sorry, your unfilter goes in that chamber and stays there for the entire run. So you start the run with that filled with protein. On the deck, you have up to eight positions for buffers. You have a position here, this green position, which is to uh, store tips during an experimental run. And then you have this position, which is empty, which is where a tip rack will go in the beginning. Now, what you see happening here is the first step of this process, which is to measure the volume. So this sensor that was picked up by the gripper is analyzing the volume that's remaining in each well. And so what it does is it is a non-contact method for those of you who are not familiar with that. Uh, it sends a small pulse of, ac of acoustic energy uh, to the into each well. It listens and waits for a reflection that comes back. Based on the amount of time it takes for that reflection to come back, it extrapolates the volume in the well and then therefore tells you what volume you have to add back in, in the next cycle. Now it's doing this measurement for every well and it does it in between every cycle because it's so important to get this number right. So for a couple of reasons. One is that it, it calculates the flow rate for each individual well. And that's important because we're walking away from this. And so we want to know that the system has some way of establishing what, how long the next pressurization cycle is going to be. So it calculates all of that stuff on the fly in between each run. It's also important because if you've done a lot of buffer exchange, you know that for sometimes you get these wells that just don't seem to flow as fast as others. And so the same thing will happen on this. It's a characteristic of the protein in the buffer and that's just kind of how it is sometimes. So what we don't want to have to happen because we're running 24 under the same conditions at the same time, we don't want these really fast wells to dry out while these slower wells are still exchanging. And so by establishing what the volume is in every well in between every cycle, we also tailor it to make sure that those fast, tailor it to those fast wells to make sure that we're not drying those out in the process of exchanging the long ones, the, the, the slower, uh, longer flowing ones. So we're done doing measurement. The gripper will put the sensor back. Now let's look at it from the front. And from the front, we'll see the next step of this, which is to pull in a tip rack. I should mention here that we're not actually running a real buffer exchange experiment. Uh, as you know from doing buffer exchange, it's kind of slow and a lot of not, nothing happening that you can kind of see. So what we've done is we've modified Big Tuna, a Big Tuna script so that it will do most of the operations and you can kind of get a sense about how it's going to work. 
So what we've seen here is the second part of the tip rack, uh, the gripper comes back and grabs a tip rack and puts it into place. So when we have started the experiment set up, we're at about six different tip racks in place. Uh, the system tells the operator how many tip racks to put in place. You'll see the gripper moves back out of position, so it's in a safe spot. The left side of this arm is going to do the liquid handling part. So this is a six tip liquid handler. You can see six syringe pumps in the back, and that's to control individual volumes that will go in every, every well. So six is a good number for this because we have a 24 well format and a 96 well format. So we're going to pick up tips in a 96 well pitch of nine millimeters, but we need to access the 24 well plate. And so the, the tip head will expand to allow us to access each of those individual wells. So we're going to aspirate buffer. In this particular setup, we have one buffer that's going into all 24 uh, proteins or all 24 wells. Uh, so we only have but you can do any sort of combination of buffers and proteins uh, together. Uh, because we're going using the same buffer in every well, we're going to pull up enough volume to access every single well. Uh, normally, if you're doing different changes, it would change tips in between. Now, what's happening here is it's dispensing the correct volume, uh, replacement volume into each individual well. Uh, the tips are actually above the well height, so the tips never make contact with the sample inside. And also, if we were changing uh, formulations, we would change tips in between. And so that ensures that you don't have cross-contamination of your protein between wells, and you don't have cross-contamination of buffers and formulations in between as well. All of the information about how, how to move from individual, so it'll always pull from the first reservoir. When it's trying to, uh, when it runs out of volume, it's tracking how much volume is pulled out and it will automatically move to the next reservoir. Again, without needing operator intervention because the operator has already been told ahead of time how much buffer it needs to repair. So in this particular case, we'll just run through and we'll dump off the excess liquid, if any. Here, we're not going to go into the tip rack because we're just doing a demo cycle. So we're just gonna go back into that uh, main tip rack. And we'll grab that tip rack uh, and move it back. So the system will allow you to reuse tips for individual uh, ex exchanges. So for example, you don't need to, a fresh tip, rack of tips every single cycle. It will track, and as long as you tell it in the software to reuse tips, it will reuse that. But you still will never have those tips go into different formulations. So they always stick to a single formulation. So we're gonna move the tip rack back into place. We're gonna retract the gripper arms to a safe position. Uh, for this demo, we'll close the buffer exchange chamber door and we'll start the cycle over again. And that's it. So uh, you might hear the, the pressure chamber door closing uh, or pressurizing again. Uh, so I hope I've given you some sense about how big tuna works. So that'll conclude the hardware piece of this. We want it to be kind of quick and fast so that we can get the questions that you may have. So, if you have any questions, uh, Tegan's already mentioned, uh, you can put them into the Q&A box below and we'll be happy to answer them uh, best we can. Thank you. Hey, Joe, nice job. Um, I, thanks a lot for doing that demo. Sure. Um, there are a bunch of questions, so okay. get ready. Here they come. Um, <laughs> right. And they're, they're good ones. I think there's some of the, some are common ones and some are, yeah. I think, specific to people's applications, so. Okay, good, don't ask me bad ones. I'll uh, only ask you the best. Ask me. So, okay. uh, for, first one here for you is, um, have you buffer exchanged proteins other than monoclonal antibodies? And oh. for example, like enzymes, larger complexes, um, you know, viral particles, what, what kind of things have yeah. we seen people and customers working with? So see, everyone's kind of different. So we, we've developed this, we had this first for monoclonal antibodies, um, but we've done lots of smaller proteins and fragments, and that's why we developed the smaller molecular weight cutoffs uh, for the 96 well plate. Um, We've also done larger things. So we've done, uh, for different demos, we have an AAV webinar coming up next week, which uses Big Tune in combination with UNCLE. So that's on September 29th, I'll plug that quickly. Um, so we do have uh, date, proof of concept data that we can show on that uh, for AAVs, but we've done other things like uh, uh, lipid nanoparticles for different customers and customers that come to us with all sorts of larger complexes that we've also uh, done in exchange on Big Tuna. Okay, great. Um, a, a question just about the unfiltered plates. Uh, can can someone use partial wells in a filter plate and save the rest of unused wells for another experiment or the next run that they might want to run? Yes. So in the software, you get an option about just identify what wells you're going to use. Uh, and uh, 
lay those out, and then you don't do anything to the other wells, uh, including add, you just leave it alone, and then you can come back and reuse those. So you have to track what wells you've used and not used, but um, yeah, you, you, can, you can use the wells that you haven't used before. I would not recommend reusing individual wells. Right, right, right. Okay, um, and then on a Big Tuna and some sample handling, just how does Big Tuna handle samples that have different viscosities or concentrations in a, in a single plate? Yeah, so the expectation is you're going to set up uh, similar conditions if you're using it, right? So I would never like recommend you run like one mg per mil and 200 mg per mil in the same plate because they're just going to run wildly differently. We don't need to know anything about that. In cases where you're running, say, the same concentration of protein, uh, you start at about the same concentration and about the same volume, uh, and then it will, will manage it on, it on a well-by-well -well basis. So uh, as I said uh, earlier, so what it will do is we'll, constant, we'll run an initial cycle uh, to first establish roughly how, how fast things are flowing and use that time for that first cycle. And every time it's going to look at, look at every flow rate for every well because it will change as you're going into different formulations. So it changes you know, on a cycle by cycle basis. So you can set it in the software. So it will always, you can do two things. You can set it where it just uses the average uh, depending on how, you know, your conditions that you're using or focus on the lower well, which is uh, basically, uh, the, you don't want that fast, run, fast well to run dry. And so, Subsequent cycles are designed to make sure that, that those faster wells will hit the exchange, uh, the, the percent removal per cycle, and everything will hit the exchange cycle. So that what that may mean is that those uh, faster wells will end up exchanging above the ex percent, percent exchange target to make sure that the slower wells have enough time uh, to reach the exchange target. Okay, great. Thanks, Joe. Um, what happens if a well gets clogged? Does the whole run stop? I, you know, that can happen yeah. with any filtration. So what, what, how do we handle that? Sure, the way we handle it is, as we met, we're checking volume in every well. And so if we've done a cycle and the volume is the same, uh, or there's a couple of things. If it stayed the same uh, or close to it, uh, the first cycle we may let it, we may let it go. But if, if it, you've done another exchange cycle and it's still that same volume and hasn't done anything, then we mark that well as an error. And so the operator uh, in the initial part, uh, the, that well will just basically be ignored for the rest of the, of the uh, experiment. So the operator can always come by and abort the run and stop it, or they can uh, let it go, the rest of the plate go in, instead. There is one exception, which is in the beginning, if it happens on the very first run, uh, that first volume measurement, the operator has the opportunity to come back and check uh, to see if there's a problem they want to remove or take care of before the, the entire unattended run goes. Right, okay. Um, if somebody has a large sample, a 20 mil sample, can they run that through Big Tuna? How would you recommend they do that? Yeah, so what they could do is use um, multiple wells of the 24 well uh, on filter. And so in the software, you can designate what wells are duplicates. And so you have the option to handle each of those as individual samples, or you could handle it as a group. So let's say for what uh, you basically hit the exchange target for the average of the three, uh, the three wells you have, or you uh, treat them all individually. So, but yeah, you can designate in the software if there are duplicates. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, and then the, what's the maximum number of proteins and buffers that Big Tuna can handle in a, in a single run? Right. It's 96, 96 by 96 in the uh, unfiltered 96 plate. So you can have up to 96 different proteins into 96 different formulations and any permutation under that. And in the unfiltered 24, you can do 24 proteins versus 24 different buffers. Right, okay. And anything less than that. Gotcha. Uh, along the lines of the larger volume, it's a little bit different question, but can it be used to concentrate the samples um, either you know, during an exchange, during a run? Yeah, there's ways to, to do that in the software, which is, let's say, are, is the question, just to clarify, like you have more than uh, eight mils of a protein that you want to start with and you want to keep adding protein? I think it's just, is there a concentration step built into the system? Are we, are we able to concentrate a sample? Yes. So you can do the exchange and you could just, you concentrate after that exchange step, or you can just walk up and concentrate. Got it. Okay. Got a bunch of questions, Joe, so let's keep going. These are good okay. ones. Um, so uh, the question is, and this is, I think, just an operational question. So they're, they're asking the, to use Big Tuna, you pipette the sample manually to start into the plate. Just clarify right. that for us. Um, 
or you could use some other type of liquid handling or a multi-channel pipetter. But just clarify that for everybody because there's a question about that. Yeah, so you're expected to start with the protein in, in the plate already. And so uh, you, you pipette in manually or you can use, uh, it's an SBS format plate. And so you could use it on another, like another liquid handler and fill it on that. Okay. Um, a question with regards to just the, the temperature of the system that somebody's asking, is there a way to maintain a particular temperature or, uh, or what, what's the situation with temperature on big tuna? Yeah, so it's at ambient temperature. So uh, whatever the room temperature is, it's going to be the uh, chamber uh, is, is at ambient or, or close to it. So it's within a degree of the ambient temperature. We've checked that uh, in the past. Uh, and what we found is that Buffer exchange happens. We, we had another product before and we used to do allow cooling for exchange. And then what has happened is that people established that it was just really slow because viscosity of solutions increase as you're, you know, you chill it. So uh, we ended, people ended up running it, everything at, at ambient temperature anyway. So on this instrument, we just have everything at ambient. Okay. Um, there's a couple of, um, I think just instrument specific questions. So hardware for you, Joe, um, just what, what kind of pneumatic connections are required for the instrument? Like how, how's it hooked up into the environment in a lab? Okay. Uh, it's, it's a, uh, I forget the, honestly, I forget the, the grade of the tubing, but it's, uh, it's just SMC tubing. So it's plastic tubing. Um, and there's like tons of connectors that you can get from McMaster car. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be regulated. Although sometimes people will do an up, upstream regulation. There's a regulator at the buffer exchange chamber that puts it at 60 PSI. So, uh, but sometimes people will do an intermediate one. So okay. it's a standard air connect connection. Another, another kind of common question here on just instruments, like how, how, how are the liquid handling lines like cleaned and stored? Is there a cleaning protocol on the system? Yeah, so there's a priming protocol before that starts before the instrument actually runs. And then, and that, that's automatic. And then there is a utility section of the software to allow you to do kind of a, a cleaning process. The system fluid that's running on the syringes is, is water. So it's not anything that's, uh, that, that I expect would need, need cleaning or would you'd have risk of clogging. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Joe, there's two, two questions. I'm going to combine them. Okay. But there, the, the question here is, you know, is you mentioned the unfilters. Um, I think just maybe go through a little bit about the two types of unfilters we have and then the molecular weight cutoffs that are currently available. Um, and then there was just that one, one small addition to that is the material they're made of. Like what is the, okay. the memory material? Okay. So uh, let me go. So plates polypropylene. The membrane is RC, regenerated cellulose. And then we fuse that into the bottom of the plate. So the molecular weight cutoffs on currently available on the, on the 96 will plate are 3, 10, 30, and 100. So we started out at 10. Uh, we made the other plates because we did have specific requests from customers about like certain application types they wanted in different sizes. Um, when I get asked this question, a lot of time it's related to flow that there's an assumption that, you know, 30 KD runs faster than 10. And, you know, and I think that's probably true, but in our hands, we haven't seen that happen. And so we haven't, that's why we don't have the different versions for the 24 well plate. So by orbital mixing, I think we take to some extent the, the, uh, uh, the requirement of the, the molecular weight cutoff uh, being a certain type to, from a speed standpoint. We have done limited testing on that, but, but from everything we've tested in our hands shows that there's not a difference in speed. Um, but yeah, so that, that's, I think that's got all the questions, all the parts of that question answered. Yeah, I think you, I think okay. you did. I think you did. People wanted to know, like, what are the membrane, uh, what's the membrane made of? What are the molecular weight cutoff choices? And what are the plate choices? And I, I think you hit them all. So thank, okay. thanks for that. Um, there's a question. I don't, I don't want you to have to walk back over to the software, but there was a question okay. about the twin colored wells in the, the screen. Why, like, yes. well, there's two, two colors on each yeah. of the wells. Can you just explain that to people? Because I think it's an important part of what's going on as it's running, right? So, yeah, so, so we, we, everything was meant to be very graphical where you could kind of figure it out. So the left hand side, when you have the twin, the left hand side is the protein. And then the right hand side is the, the formulation that you're exchanging it into. So if I was doing one, for, one protein versus one buffer in 24 wells, you'd have basically two colors on the whole thing, right? So that's, that's kind of, that's just where the color scheme is. And there's views that you can toggle between if you want to just look at proteins or just look at buffers. Um, I happen to be on the look at both at the same time. Okay, great. Um, you know, there, there are a couple of questions that are very specific to someone's sample type. And so Joe, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to put you on the spot for those. Okay. I just want to tell those of you that have put in something very specific about a certain molecule, 
we'll reach out to you and talk to you directly about those uh, those questions. And I promise you that will happen either from one of our application scientists or our team here. So, Joe, um, thank you for the great presentation. I thought it was fantastic. Thanks for answering all those questions. And thank you to all of you who joined us today. Thanks for asking all the great questions. Um, if you're interested in um, a follow-up discussion with our team, we're happy to do it virtually. You know, here in California, I'm at home, Joe's at our office, you know, we're still being really careful. Um, we're great at doing demos and doing meetings over Zoom, just like this. We're happy to do that with you individually, talk about your specific situation, your specific samples. So just please reach out to us and uh, we'll, we'll make that happen with you. So again, Joe, thanks a lot. Great presentation, nice demo. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.